The Discoverers, Chapter 32 Paradise Found and Lost On shipboard off the Azores in mid-February 1493, returning from his first voyage, Columbus wrote his own report of what he thought and wanted others to think that he had accomplished. Since it would have been disrespectful for him to address Ferdinand and Isabel directly, he reported to them in a letter addressed to Santangle, the crown official, who had persuaded Queen Isabel at the very last moment to support Columbus's enterprises of the Indies. Columbus's letter, written in Spanish, was printed in Barcelona about April 1, 1493, then translated into Latin, dated April 29th, and again printed in Rome in May as an eight-page pamphlet entitled De Insulis Intuitis. Frequently and speedily reprinted by the standards of its day, it became a bestseller. At Rome, there were three further editions in 1493, and six different editions printed at Paris, Basel, and Antwerp in 1493 and 1494. By mid-June 1493, the Latin letter had been translated into a 68-stanza poem, written in Rome and twice in Florence in 1493, in Tuscan, the dialect of Florence. Northern Europe only slowly received news of Columbus's exploit. The famous Nuremberg Chronicle, an illustrated world history from the creation to the present, printed on July 12, 1493, made no mention of Columbus's voyage. Not until late March, 1496, do we find word of Columbus in England and the first German translation of Columbus's letter was printed in Strasbourg in 1497. What was the news that Columbus brought? The first illustrated Latin edition of his report, Basel, 1493, carried crude woodcuts that had already been used in earlier Swiss books that had no connection with Columbus, the Indies, or the New World. One woodcut purported to show the landing of Columbus in the Indies, in a 40 oared Mediterranean galley. Another, supposed to represent the Bahama Islands, could have depicted any South European seaside village. Columbus, having convinced himself that a trip across the Western Ocean would take him to the Indies, now set about convincing a wider audience. He had a heavy vested interest in his destination actually being the Indies. In this first public announcement of his momentous voyage, Columbus was careful not to mention disasters or near disasters, the loss of the flagship Santa Maria, the insubordination of Martin Alsanzo Penzan, the commander of the Pinta, or the murderous spirit of the crew. Following the national security regulations of his days, he omitted information on the course taken or the precise distance covered in order to prevent competitors from following where he had led. While Columbus conceded that he had not actually seen the Great Khan or the court of the gold-rich Sipangu, that is, Japan, he detailed numerous clues reinforcing his belief that he was just off the coast of China. The resplendent Great Khan, he was confident, would be found just a little further on, doubtless on the next voyage. Although Columbus was a hard-headed observer of wind and waves on the crucial question of where he had arrived, he remained the slave of his hope. He was determined to find signs everywhere that he had reached the fringes of Asia. Botany, still a vague wilderness whose images were not yet standardized by printing, was his happy hunting ground. From the moment when he first touched the north coast of Cuba on his first voyage, he had no trouble finding the Asiatic flora. A shrub that smelled like cinnamon he eagerly called cinnamon, and so made a hint of untold spice treasures. The aromatic West Indies gumbo limbo, he insisted, was an Asiatic form of the mastic tree of the Mediterranean that yielded resin. A small inedible nut, the Nogal de Paz, he hastily mistook for the coconut described by Marco Polo. The ship's surgeon examined some roots that the men had dug up and obligingly pronounced them the valuable medicinal Chinese rhubarb, a strong cathartic drug. 
Actually, it was only the common garden rhubarb that we use for pies and tarts. Rum, ramponticum. Not the pharmacist, rum, officinal. But so many false scents somehow seemed to add up to the authentic odor of the Orient. In the mind of Columbus, such clues quickly clenched the thesis that he had secured support for his enterprise of the Indies. Typical of his fame of mind and his exploring techniques was his first expedition into Cuba. On October 28, 1492, Columbus's caravels entered Bahia Barre, a beautiful harbor in the Orient province of Cuba. There, the captive San Salvador natives, who he'd brought along as interpreters, interviewed the local Indians and told Columbus there was gold at Cubanican, meaning mid-Cuba, only a short trek inland. Columbus eagerly assumed that they had meant to say El Gran Can, the great Khan of China, and at once sent an embassy to meet the Oriental potentate. An Arabic-speaking scholar whom he had brought along for just such missions was put in charge, accompanied by an able seaman who years before had once encountered an African king in Guinea, and so was supposed to know how to deal with exotic royalty. They took along diplomatic paraphernalia, their Latin passport, a letter of credence from their Catholic majesties to his Chinese majesty, and a rich gift for the Khan, along with glass beads and trinkets to buy food en route. Led on by visions of Kambulak, which had been named by Marco Polo as the Mongol capital of China, where the Khan held his splendid court, they hiked up the valley of the Kukoyogin River. What they found were some 50 palm-thatched huts. The local Kaku feasted them as messengers from the sky, and the people kissed their feet but they got no word of the great Khan. On the trail back to the harbor, Columbus's two ambassadors did have one epical encounter. They met a walking party of Taino Indians, many people who were going to their villages with a firebrand in the hand and herbs to drink the smoke thereof as they are accustomed. The long cigar that they carried would be relighted at every stop by small boys carrying along firebrands then passed around for each member of the party to take a few drags through his nostrils. After a relaxing interval, the Tainos assumed their journey. This was the first recorded European encounter with tobacco. Obsessed by visions of China's gold, Columbus's embassy saw only a primitive custom. Some years later, when the Spaniards had colonized the New World and learned to enjoy tobacco themselves, they introduced it to Europe, Asia, and Africa, where it was to become a source of wealth, delight, and dismay. Meanwhile, Columbus remained back at the harbor, working up the figures from his dead reckoning to confirm his conviction that Cuba really was Marco Polo's province of Mangue. He occupied his spare moments gathering the botanical specimens that he believed could not be found anywhere except in Asia. The conspicuously pious Christian nomenclature that Columbus affixed on the lands he first visited, San Salvador, Navidad, Santa Maria de Guadalupe, S.M. de Montserrat, S.M. La Antigua, S.M. La Redonda, San Martin, San George, Santa Anastasia, San Cristobal, Santa Cruz, Santa Ursula, E. Los Chi Milvergines, San Juan Batista, bore witness to his proverbial piety. It was his divinely appointed errand to enlarge the realm of the true faith with the souls of pagan millions. His confidence as God's messenger had given him strength to bear years of ridicule, to risk mutiny, and would continue to shape his views of world geography. Columbus's first voyage had many features of a Caribbean cruise, for he mainly enjoyed the sights and sounds and curiosities which he could witness from the coast with only occasional short excursions inland. He had speedily coursed through the Bahamas, then skirted the north coast of eastern Cuba and of Hispaniola. Just three months after he first sighted the land of the Indies, the island of San Salvador, his caravel set sail on January 16, 1493, 
from Samana Bay on the eastern end of the island of Hispaniola to return home. After so brief a journey to the peripheral islands with so little experience of the interior and such ambiguous clues to the oriental character of the country, Columbus remained undaunted in his faith. His reports revealed no doubt that he had reached the Indies, and he generalized with all the confidence of the quicky tourists. The natives, he asserted, were so ingenuous and free with all they have that no one would believe it who was not to see in it. Of anyone that they possessed, if it be asked of them, they never say no. On the contrary, they invite you to share it and show as much love as if their hearts went with it, and they are content with whatever trifle be given them, whether it be a thing of value or of petty worth. In all these islands, I saw no great diversity in the appearance of the people or in their manners and language, but they all understood one another, which is a very singular thing, on account of which I hope that their highnesses will determine upon their conversion to our holy faith, toward which they are much inclined. The place he chose for La Villa de Navid was in the best district for the gold mines and for every trade, both with its continent and with that over there belonging to the great Khan, the great Khan, where there will be great trade and profit. To their Catholic Highnesses, he promised as much gold as they want if their Highnesses will render me a little help. Besides spices and cotton, as much as their Highnesses shall command, and gum and mastic, as much as they shall order shipped, and aloe wood, as much as they shall order shipped, and slaves, as many as they shall order, who will be idolaters. And I believe that I have found rhubarb and cinnamon, and I shall find a thousand other things of value, which the people whom I have left there will have discovered, for I have not delayed anywhere, provided the wind allow me to sail. And we'll go on with this chapter in the next video. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you guys. I love you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.